Um, hi, hi everybody, good afternoon, and welcome to On Demand Data Services with Cloud Foundry. Um, quick introductions, my name is Maria, and I am a developer for the Cloud Foundry Redis team in Pivotal London. Uh, good evening, I'm uh, Simon Jones, uh, I'm a developer in Pivotal London, uh, and I work on the On Demand Service Broker team. All right, so over the course of the next Oh. Is it hard? <laughs> I just <died> again. <laughs> oh my. Right. It's interesting. Over the next 30 minutes, we are going to have a quick refresher on what Cloud Foundry services do for us and how Bosch fits into the equation. Um, we'll then look at the traditional approach that we've generally followed so far to uh, deploy Cloud Foundry services, move on to the path for on-demand provisioning, and finally, we're going to look at how we would go about developing an on-demand service broker. Um, Cloud Foundry services are a very important part of what the platform offers to application developers. Just by pushing an application with CF Push, I have really no way of storing state or even sharing data and sharing state with other applications. That's where um, services come in. So we can uh, discover available services using the Cloud Foundry Marketplace. And there's a wide range, range of services available. So for example, data stores, databases, uh, caches, message queues, or even user accounts for external services. Um, once we've picked our favorite service, we can go ahead and create an instance of it with CF Create Service. Um, we can then bind our application so that the application can start using it with CF Bind. Um, if we ever want to change properties or move our service instance to use a new plan with new configuration, we can do so with CF Update Service. Um, and finally, we, when the application no longer needs the service, it can CF Unbind itself and then we can go ahead and CF Delete the service. Um, an approach that service authors have followed so far to implement the workflow that we just saw has been that of pre-provisioned instances. And in that world, Bosch would come in, it would deploy, deploy Cloud Foundry, but it would also deploy the service broker VM and a pre-decided and pre-declared by the operator number of service instances. And they would form a sort of pool, if you want, of available instances that would just hang around there um, until a CF user needs one. Um, so then when an application developer would need a MySQL instance, for example, they would type CF create service, then the uh, cloud controller would forward that request to the service broker. The service broker would go away, figure out if it has an available instance in its pool, reserve it, and return success or failure to uh, Cloud Foundry. There are some advantages to that approach. Uh, mainly the, the cost is fixed, so we know in advance how many VMs we're provisioning, what sort of sizes, so we know kind of what bill we'll, we'll be paying. And also the provisioning times are quite quick because there's no VMs to spin up at that point and no software to deploy. However, pre-provisioned instances cost money really doing nothing until they're actually claimed. Um, they're not configurable, so they're all exactly the same. It's hard to scale them up because it means that you have to redeploy the whole ecosystem of the broker and the pool. Um, and finally, it's near impossible to scale down safely. So we think there might be a better way to achieve these goals, uh, and uh, we think uh, this concept we've called on-demand uh, provisioning uh, could help with that. So this means that the application developer through the CFCLI uh, create and delete service actions would actually cause a deployment, a provision to happen, and then that service gets deleted. So this really helps with our resource consumption uh, because we know that until the application developer needs to make use of that service, there is nothing uh, being consumed. And as soon as the application developer is finished with the service, again, there is nothing being consumed. So we don't have anything lying around waiting to be used. Uh, we can also provide operator freedom uh, using on-demand provisioning. Um, operators can define plans and quotas so that different types of your service can be, uh, can be created and used by your application developer depending on their needs. Uh, 
We've also got the application developer freedom as they can consume those different plans. Uh, they can also, uh, depending on what's been permitted by the service author and operator, uh, take further configuration steps. And these all have to be pre-approved, so uh, the operator can be safe in the knowledge of what's happening. So, so what does this look like? Well, the service broker uh, has to ultimately take responsibility for deploying and managing the life cycle uh, of service instances. So your broker now needs to deploy, update, and delete services as the requests from Cloud Foundry come in. Um, and you probably want to use a, a deployment manager uh, and integrate a deployment manager with your service broker. So what did Cloud Foundry have to do to enable this new workflow uh, where we're actually going out and provisioning? Well, Cloud Foundry implements the Open Service Broker API uh, already, and not a lot really needed to change with this. The, uh, the endpoints already existed to, to manage a lifecycle of a service, of course, as we saw. Um, but what was, was missing was asynchronous operations. So we previously had a default timeout of 30 seconds for calling the create service uh, command. Uh, and that's a little bit too short uh, for a lot of services to go off and actually deploy. It takes a little bit longer. So the, uh, the state changing uh, operations like provision, updates, and deprovision can now be called asynchronously. And we have a last operation endpoint to go and uh, ask about the state of that. So you might see services in the state of create in progress or delete in progress rather than uh, created or delete or not there. Um, so that's actually everything that you would need to create uh, an on-demand service broker um, or an on-demand service. So um, are we done? Well, we think we can probably provide something a little bit better in the way of tooling. Um, everyone going out and implementing their own version of deploying software uh, would lead to a lot of duplicated effort. So in steps the on-demand service broker. This is an open source release that Pivotal have developed. Um, this is a web server that implements the uh, open service broker API. Uh, so Cloud Foundry can, uh, can communicate uh, with it. It receives a request from Cloud Foundry and it makes requests uh, to Bosch, uh, which is our deployment manager of choice. Um, and we'll take a closer look at Bosch in a second. Um, and the on-demand broker takes all of the uh, generic uh, steps that are involved in making a Bosch deployment, updating that Bosch deployment, binding, uh, unbinding to that, um, but it, doesn't, it can't know everything. So we want to be able to use this broker to deploy as many different types of services as possible. Um, so we need something with that service specific knowledge. So what we would want service authors to create is uh, this thing called a service adapter. And that ultimately can create manifests for our, service, uh, for our on demand broker to deploy the service instances. Uh, and it will manage the bind and unbinding um, as each service has a different concept of, of what an account might look like. So this is available as a Bosch release, uh, and as I mentioned, it's open source. The URL is here, and uh, we'll include that in the resources at the end. So just to take a step back, we've mentioned that we're going to use Bosch as our deployment manager of choice. Uh, Bosch is currently used to deploy Cloud Foundry and a lot of the uh, pre-provisioned uh, pre instance services. So this may turn to Pivotal. Um, so there should be familiarity, hopefully, within, within the community. Um, but just to, to redefine that. So uh, it manages a distributed software lifecycle, and it covers the packaging, deploying, uh, running, and upgrading of software. Um, and it actually manages the deployments using a declarative manifest. So you define what the desired state that you want your deployment to look like is, for example, how many VMs and what type of VM you want to deploy to, uh, and Bosch will go and converge to that state. So we did have to make a, a few changes, or we, or we had some, some Bosch features added which were very useful for the on-demand service uh, lifecycle. Um, 
And a lot of this was to do with how deployment manifests used to look. So we would include networking, subnets, and static IPs directly in the deployment manifests. We'd include a lot of infrastructure detail uh, in, in every single deployment manifest. And this became quite complicated. In order for humans to, uh, to, to be deploying um, Bosch uh, deployments, we came up with tools like Spiff and Spruce to try and help us out. Um, and it becomes even more automated. Uh, it becomes even more complicated with automation, uh, where we're trying to figure out which IP ranges are going to be available for our new service instance. Um, becomes very difficult. So this logic has been moved to the to centralized in the Bosch director. So we now provide a cloud config. Uh, and we have a dynamic IP allocation. So the cloud config uh, contains the knowledge of what uh, VMs and networks look like. Um, and uh, each of the deployments can make use of uh, references in the cloud config, but they don't need to know about those things uh, themselves. Um, we also added uh, Bosch teams uh, to, to Bosch. Um, and the reason for this is that a broker needs to use something with admin-like permissions in order to create and delete uh, service instance deployments. Um, but we only want them to be able to do that for their own um, deployments. So we don't want uh, rogue service brokers to go deleting your Cloud Foundry or anything like this. Um, it also allows uh, multiple service brokers to exist harmoniously. All right, so um, the, now the way the, that an on-demand broker is operated is important to service authors because the input that an operator might give uh, needs to be considered when we go ahead and author our service adapter. So we're gonna have a quick look at that. Um, so when an operator deploys an on-demand broker, they will write a Bosch manifest just as they used to, nothing new here. Uh, in that manifest, they will specify things like, for example, where the Bosch director lives that they want to talk to, where does the cloud controller live that they want to talk to, and so on. But they will also define uh, the catalog for the broker, which includes how the service offering will show up in the marketplace and also what plans will be configured and what quotas are applied. Okay, let's have a closer look at plans. So these are operator defined. They include size, so VM size, disk size, and configuration options. Um, and they will pro be provided as input to the service adapter for the manifest generation, which we will look at shortly. Um, quotas are also operator defined. They can be applied per plan and they can also be applied on the service offering globally. Um, they're there to help the operator manage service usage so they don't end up with way more instances that they were anticipating. Um, as service authors, we don't really need to worry about them. They are enforced by the broker, um, by the on-demand broker, and the service adapter doesn't really need to do anything about them. Okay, so let's move to uh, how we would go about developing an on-demand broker. There are basically two components that, that are required to make a service use the on-demand broker. First of all, you'll need your service packaged as a Bosch release or a set of Bosch releases. And secondly, you'll need an adapter. So that's an executable which is also packaged as a Bosch release. And we'll look at both of them just now. Um, the service release, first of all. So we saw just before that the broker must be able to instruct the Bosch on what it is that it wants deployed in the format of the Bosch manifest. That manifest will describe the topology and also the software or um, or release in Bosch terms that we want deployed on each component of that topology. So the first step of authoring an on-demand uh, service broker is creating that service release. That release will encapsulate your service. It is deployable by Bosch. And the main consideration here is what are the configuration options that we want to open up to either the operators or the application developers, and then to ensure that these options that we want to expose make it into the spec file or the spec files of that release. Okay, so moving on to developing the service adapter. Um, we saw previously that this is an executable that lives right next to the on-demand broker and adds uh, spe service-specific knowledge to the mix. Um, let's have a look at how it fits into the larger image of a, service, a Cloud Foundry service instances lifecycle. So when an application developer um, goes ahead and types CF create service, the cloud controller will receive that request and will send it on to this on-demand service broker. 
That request includes two pieces of interesting information. The first one is the plan that the application developer chose. And remember that plans are configured by operators, so they contain some uh, configuration there. Secondly, the request will pass on any arbitrary parameters that the application developer may have passed with a dash C flag. The adapter executable is then expected to use the plan configuration and the arbitrary parameters and combine them to generate a Bosch manifest. The on-demand broker then will give that manifest to Bosch and Bosch will go ahead and deploy the service instance. We have a very similar workflow with CF update. Uh, again, the on-demand broker will get, well, first of all, the on-demand broker will get the current manifest from Bosch and then we'll give it to the adapter together with the new plan configuration and the new arbitrary parameters. The um, adapter will then do what it needs to do to combine those into an updated manifest that gets given to Bosch and gets deployed as an updated instance. Um, it's in the adapter's logic and it's in the adapter's hand to decide the priority of existing versus new configuration. So a lot of the time you might want to apply the new configuration, other times you want to ignore it and just um, keep what you had in the original instance. And so we're going to actually have a, a quick overview of, of how we think some of that might, uh, logic might look in, in our service adapters when we are generating the manifest. So first of all, uh, we'll take a look at the arguments that we're going to provide. And these should hopefully contain all of the details that an adapter is going to need to create a manifest in any given situation. So the command is uh, generate manifest. Um, we're passing in the, uh, the service deployment uh, block, which includes a list of the releases and stem cells along with the versions of those that we're expecting to use in, in our deployment. Um, we're going to pass in uh, the plan. So this is defined by the operator, but a schema would be defined by the service author. So you know what sort of things you're going to expect to receive in this JSON, but you don't know exactly what the details are. And this will be things like the service plan and might describe what instance types are going to be used in your manifest, uh, how many of them, uh, and also what properties you want to include in your manifest for this particular plan and what values. Uh, we're also going to receive the request parameters. Uh, these are arbitrary parameters that are defined on the CFCLI by the application developer. Now again, the, uh, the schema for this should be defined by the service author. So you should know what sort of parameters uh, you want to expect and what are sensible values for those. And you can, of course, ignore arbitrary parameters that you weren't expecting to receive. Um, we've also got the uh, previous manifest. So the last two arguments uh, are only provided in the case that you are performing an update. Uh, so we get the, the existing configuration in the form of the currently deployed manifest. Um, and that allows us to work out what the deployment currently looks like. And more specifically, if someone has previously configured arbitrary parameters, you may want to keep those in your, uh, in your current deployment. And similarly with the plan, uh, this all plays into uh, this slightly complicated bit of logic you might need to determine whether a parameter was set using a, an arbitrary uh, parameter command or using the previous plan and whether that needs to be updated to the new plan. And the adapter chooses the priority of that. So it's important uh, for the generate manifest command to always return a consistent response when given the same inputs. It's not quite a pure function because depending how you implement it, it might have some side effects, but the output does have to be identical. And that's used in a comparison when we try to uh, block incidental changes uh, being made when an application developer has asked for an update to be made. And that might happen if the operator has updated the broker and included newer releases. And we basically don't want too many things to be happening at the same time. So we block the, uh, the developer uh, triggered update and it's up to the operator to trigger a platform upgrade to make sure everyone gets the new changes at once. So this is a sort of not quite example, uh, a bit of pseudocode uh, for what some logic might look for generating a manifest. So first up, you're going to create the skeleton. You're then going to interpolate any uh, previous manifest properties, 
previous plan properties come after that. Um, and then finally, you add, you add the new plan properties, any arbitrary parameters, before you print the manifest uh, in uh, plain text to stand it out. And hopefully, you'll exit zero, uh, and the on-demand broker will know that it's been a successful uh, manifest generation. So uh, looking now at the CF bind service request and that, how that translates into calls to our service adapter, um, again, pretty similarly, the uh, on-demand broker will receive that request and forward it on to the service adapter, having also originally, first of all, requested the existing manifest from Bosch. The adapter method that is called is, uh, on the adapter, is called uh, create binding, and a typical request to create binding will involve connecting, for example, to the provisioned instance and creating a user. Um, other services simply look at the manifest to get admin credentials and return those. Um, the binding ID is provided by the cloud controller and can be used as a unique identifier for the binding being created. This is quite handy also for the unbind um, service lifecycle because the adapter might have to go ahead and delete that user later. So it's important to keep it as a mapping where required. Bosch VMs is again a list of the VMs that make up the service instance. They are important in the uh, binding creation context in case the adapter needs to go uh, and reach out to them and create users or create topics, for example, in the Kafka um, on-demand service. The manifest YAML is the existing deployed Bosch manifest. Um, some adapters use it to extract admin credentials or other information that's unique to the already provisioned instance. Um, and finally, request parameters are arbitrary parameters passed by the applic application developer using the CFCLI. Um, and again, they could be, um, they're used, for example, in the Kafka service instance to create uh, custom topics instead of having a topic named after the uh, binding, sorry, the, yeah, the binding ID. Um, many services will behave differently, um, and it really depends on your specific adapter. Um, what exactly you're going to, what subset of these arguments you're going to use. And then we come to unbind. So uh, when the uh, developer has, or the application has finished using a service, uh, they're gonna call uh, unbind. And uh, it's a pretty similar order of uh, events to uh, bind. And really, it should be a, a mirror image. So whatever you're going to do in bind, you're, you're likely to want to do in unbind, uh, but the reverse of it. So you receive the same arguments. Uh, that's, uh, that's obviously crucial, because whatever you needed to connect to uh, during your bind process, you may also need to connect to during unbinding. Uh, the binding ID is very useful, uh, as mentioned, in uniquely identifying accounts. So you should probably, if you are creating a user account, name it uh, after the binding ID so that you can then delete it during an unbind. Um, so that's really it for uh, deleting binding. There is a fourth uh, method that's expected of a service adapter. It's called dashboard URL. Um, it uses a lot of the same themes, but we're, we're not going to cover that. So that's available in the documentation. So um, again, this is, this is sort of everything you need now. If you implement these four methods and then co-locate on uh, a, a release with the, with the on-demand service broker, you're going to get um, a working on-demand service, hopefully. Um, but we, again, we think we can do a little bit better than this. Um, so your service authors, as service authors, you can choose any language uh, which can respond as an executable to write your service adapter in. Uh, but the favored language of the development team is Golang. Um, and as such, we've made um, an SDK available. Uh, it's available at this URL. And um, that helps out with things like command line passing, which again is quite repetitive, the response serialization, a bit of error handling there, uh, and provides a, a really simple interface for service authors, adapter authors, uh, just to, to fulfill that interface. And that allows you to, excuse me, that allows you to concentrate on that service specific knowledge and really um, not care too much about uh, how to manage uh, command line parameters. Um, and this does leave us with one missing part of the life cycle, 
um, and that is a deletion of an on-demand instance. And we didn't mention that because the on-demand broker actually has all of the information required to delete a service instance. So you don't need to uh, implement anything in your service adapter to fulfill this part of the lifecycle. Okay, so to ensure that you get the fastest feedback when developing and also to help improve the reliability of your on-demand service that you've just developed, um, we do very highly recommend that you test your components. Now, there is really no right or wrong way of doing that, also because it depends so much on the specific service that you're building. Um, but we've put together a couple of ideas to consider. So, as a minimum, it would be a good idea to cover uh, manifest generation, binding, unbinding, and dashboard URL with tests against the, um, the service adapter. Um, these should generally test the executable, call the various subcommands, and make assertions on the exit code, and also the contents of standard out and standard error, so the, um, any errors that come out and any produced manifests and bindings. Um, it's a good idea to cover updates as well as uh, original manifest generation. Um, after that, tests in the service release are really helpful because they validate the effect that configuration options have on the runtime configuration of the instance. So once you've generated that manifest with your adapter, um, how are you sure that the uh, impact and the effect that they had in provisioning that instance is what you expected? Um, moving a level out on the dotted blue line, um, that would test, so you would like a bunch of integration tests to test that your adapter communicates um, well with any external components. So some examples are in on-demand service instances where bindings need to happen in collaboration with a service instance. That's a, a very good place to test that. Um, finally, it's good to test your deployed system with a set of lifecycle tests, which is the sort of outer um, border. Um, here, what we usually look at are end-to-end -end tests to validate the happy path of an instance lifecycle. So I create service, I bind, read some data, uh, sorry, write some data, read some data, unbind and delete the service instance. And ideally, you'd like the customer to be able to run those as smoke tests on their own installation to confirm that they have a successful configuration. Uh, fantastic. So now you really do have uh, an on-demand uh, service available. So just to cover what we've looked at today, um, we've got the concept of on-demand services as uh, something that is application developer triggered uh, from the CFCLI, um, but co uh, controlled through plans and quotas by the, uh, by the operator and the service author. Um, we've uh, introduced the on-demand service broker, which is a tool packaged as a Bosch release, uh, which will manage the lifecycle of an on-demand service uh, using Bosch as a deployment tool. Uh, and then we've identified that your on-demand service, whatever that may be, whatever that may look like, um, would consist of uh, your service release combined with a service adapter that knows about your service release. Uh, so we've got some resources up here, uh, some documentation, um, some example uh, adapter releases. So I'll leave that up there so we can take some pictures. But the next slide, I assure you, uh, does ask for questions. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, use, it uses a, a command runner to, to run that as, as though it would use, um, uh, as though you would on, a, on a, a terminal or something, yeah. Yes? Um, it's definitely being considered. Um, so in terms of the actual life cycle, we, we, we like to sort of, it, it is tested by the um, on-demand broker team in Pivotal. So uh, that's, um, that, that, that would be good to, to add, I think. Um, but how much we could abstract might be interesting. Um, I think we'd also like to 
do uh, kind of configuration confirmation so that rather than testing by results, so you know, if you wanted to test that quotas were working, you might have to go out and actually deploy too many service instances. Um, it might be nicer to, for us to say, this is what we think your configuration looks like. Any more? Okay, well thank you all for joining us so late in the day. <laughs>